encryption just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast. This is Christopher here, as always, with Tom. Tom, how are you doing? Not too bad. It's a wintry wonderland in the great world we live in these days. Yes, down here in the in the Midwest and other places of the country, it is cold. <laughs> There's no other way to say it. Yes, no, just uh, at the time of recording, just went through the university trying to deal with inclement weather which is always entertaining. Yeah, it's been single digits at night around here and negative wind chills. It's it's why I don't like winter. But uh, tell you, before we go any further, I do want to apologize to our listeners for the last several episodes. There have been some serious audio issues that I wasn't aware of. Oh, really? Because I'm an, I'm an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> There was an update to the editing software that I use, and when it did so, it defaulted to uh, in 8-bit format at one point oh. when I export the audio out. And, yeah, that makes the audio sound like crap. Oh, yeah. So it, it sounded good a whole time while I was editing, and then when I do the initial exports and then make the MP3s, I typically don't go back and re-listen to it right. at all. Because it was fine then, it should be fine, and yeah, my mistake um, that's been fixed. <laughs> but you should be able to go back and uh, listen to our uh, our time hop on Hellhounds. That sounds fine. We're good. It's just uh, the unfortunately the three or four things that were recorded prior to that, not so much. Listeners, I, I will tell you, uh, if anyone's had any experience in, in editing, aside from the various updates that can come out, uh, it does get a little mind-numbing for the editor to listen to it over and over and over again. And at some point, you have to bail out. So I forgive you completely for not having re-listened <laughs> to it again. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, my, my apologies, everyone. I'm glad. Uh, and it, it, it was <clears throat> funny when I realized the problem. Yeah. I went to uh, the the Audacity, which is what I use to edit, and for like, oh, okay, I'll do a quick test, and we'll see if I can figure out where it's going. And as soon as I opened it up and went to do the export, it immediately jumped out to me what needed to be changed. <laughs> it was right there in front of me the whole time. I'm like, ah. Yeah, you just hate it when those, uh, those updates uh, also change default settings. Yes. It, it's a real, it's a thing you got to watch out for, so... Apparently. <laughs> so. And I, lesson learned is all I'm saying. Indeed. That's all you can do. We learn, we grow. <laughs> so what have you been up to, Tom? Have you had a chance? Has life calmed down a little bit for you that you've been able to watch anything and in, interest or do anything interesting? <sighs> oh, well, no. <laughs> no. Uh, last week was kind of murderous for from a work perspective trying to get ready for the semester that then got abbreviated the start this week thanks to the weather um, uh, also brings up uh, this is not related to anything we talk about but it is an interesting change in the world right now so again i work for a school correct um yeah it's so you thing. say yes. <laughs> so the concept of the snow day Mm -hmm. To have one typically in the past meant everybody's off. You can't go into work. You can't have classes. You're off, right? Not in the world of Zoom and Teams and, no, and things have changed. departments yeah. that don't live on campus. They're fully remote. Heck, some of our people aren't even in the same state anymore. And it starts calling into the question, what does it mean to take an inclement weather day? <laughs> so these are the things that have been preoccupying my time lately. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, no, I've, I've heard these discussions where they're talking about that, you know, the you can keep the schools closed but still have school because everyone can just zoom in. Oh, and it, it gets extra complicated when you start splitting your day because uh, today we had a circumstance where they said, okay, campus is not open until 10, but all classes beforehand are virtual how do you cross from virtual to in person if you're teaching virtual and now you got to rush into school to teach in person i if you don't have a lot of classes that day maybe not a big deal but it could be quite frustrating if your first class is at nine the next one's at 10 and you got 10 minutes to get to campus Nah, that's not gonna work (laughs) yeah that's a little crazy other than you know maybe you risk it and go in early and uh, yeah. <laughs> do your calling from the campus. but Indeed. But other than that, um, in, in spare time, I have still been making my way slowly through the old, uh, the first several seasons of uh, the Grand Tour. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. I went a little quicker. I, I actually buzzed through them not that long ago. Hmm. Uh, just head to hankering and did them all again um i did watch uh speaking of that uh, james may they did the uh, uh our what our man in oh yeah his, yeah. his travel show yeah. uh he went to uh oh uh, where did he go <laughs> uh india india okay they only did uh they only did it i think three episodes most of his the seasons have been six this one was only three oh, okay but it was still still a lot of fun i i think i really in, I might enjoy his uh, travel shows more than I ever enjoyed him on the car shows. I, I could see that. There, there there would be reason for that. Other than that, I watched something I've not watched in forever and never got the chance to see the whole thing. Do you remember 2011 series The Cape? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I do. It got involved in a conversation here uh, about... Hey, did anyone remember that show that came? <laughs> and of course, I remember it because Summer Glau is in it. <laughs> Summer Glau is in it, along with uh, the star David Lyons, also stars Keith David and James Frain. This thing was in uh, was in 2011. NBC created it and aired it as a mid-season replacement. And they only gave it 10 episodes, yeah. only nine of which aired. Oh, jeez. If you wanted to see the finale, you had to go to their website. Uh, I watched it, and I think I saw the first half of the season, and I think by that point they started preempting and juggling it around, and I lost track and never saw how it wrapped up or anything. Yeah. So I had the opportunity to go ahead and watch it, and I burned through it. It is another one of these things where about the time NBC said, oh, screw it, put something else on or move it or you know put it on this date, when they started messing around with it and everything, it's when it kind of started picking up. <laughs> and it, now it's another one of these series where you're like, I'm really ticked this did not get its fair chance. It was ahead of its time. Yeah. It was better than most of what I've seen on the CW. You know, not, a, 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 a decade bar. later. <laughs> yeah. But you're only talking a few years from now, you start getting into the stuff that, you know, turns into the Arrowverse. Yeah. Or a few years from when this came out. Yeah, it was absolutely ahead of its time. And it's really unfortunate because it, would, it ended up being really entertaining. I mean, it had some... It was, yes, it was a little campy. Absolutely. That's I what mean, I remember most about it. Not not so much as a distractor. It's just, uh, you just had to know that. <laughs> yeah, but it was done serious. It was not like 60s Batman or anything. Right. Or it wasn't like the, uh, that made for TV um, attempt at the, what was it? The, the, the Spectre or whatever. Oh, the, yeah, yeah. the film we watched and it turned out there was someone, they tried to make a, a, a series on it and there was the, the made for TV. Oh, uh, the spirit. The spirit. Thank you. Uh, it wasn't along those lines. It was done actually very seriously. The production values were high. They ended up introducing some, uh, some villains that were like legitimately like dark Batman, scary villains yeah. level. And I'm like, this should have continued <laughs> and it didn't. It's like, man, that's 
that's such a shame that it it turned into a uh, as I understand it a, a punchline in the show community with a uh, Keith David who appeared on, on that series apparently and yeah it's just real unfortunate that it gets sort of a a pandering and it and, and turned into a joke when it's like this you should have actually watched the whole thing. <laughs> I intend to revisit it, but I do remember the uh, the one villain chess was kind of cheesy, especially with his uh, chess piece contact lenses. It was when he was really the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, it he starts out cheesy, but I think they they do right by him as a villain in the end. Yeah, like you, I I struggled with uh, putting any continuity to it back when it first aired. Yeah, I could never find it to catch it, and it got became all disjointed. So uh, now that I have an avenue to watch it, uh, uh, I will have to take that up. I'm still poking around, season to season, episode to episode on uh, Next Generation. Yep. Again, I just can't uh, really bring myself to sit there and just watch it beginning to end because I just keep hitting the too many episodes that it's even if I like the episode, it's just. I know that episode so well. <laughs> it is a thing that when you love something like that, where you have already watched it so many times, just even starting the episode, like the first 30, 40 seconds of it are enough to go, yep, I got it. I know what all that is about. <laughs> I I don't even get past the thumbnail and the, and the brief descriptor on the website. It's just, oh, yeah, that one. I'll move on. Oh, yeah, that one. <laughs> I did watch The Best of Both Worlds, Part 1 and 2. Always a good one. Part 1 is still just some of the best damn TV that there has ever been on TV. No, it was amazing. And it's also the first time that I ever recall being completely terribly angry at my television set. (laughs) Absolutely. Back in, uh, what was it, the spring of 1990, Mm -hmm. we are all sitting on the edge of our seat, and that stupid Do Be Continued comes up. (laughs) (laughs) And and, and knowing full well you aren't going to watch, you aren't going to know what happens till September. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Like, ah! Yeah, and this this is long before internet this is long before there was you know forums and fan groups and anything that had any kind of discussions or spoilers or interviews or anything so it was literally you're just left hanging yeah and actually do you know offhand what year that was 1990 1990 yes yeah, so that would have been my that would have been my junior year going into my senior year of high school and uh, that would have yeah there was no way to find out any information about what the story was going to be like on the other end. You couldn't spoil it for yourself. And well, from what I read, they didn't know what was going to be on the other end. Oh, really? They wrote part one and didn't write part two because there was a lot of uh, contract negotiations and stuff. They literally didn't know who was going to be back next year. Oh, wow. So this was also an opportunity to openly remove characters if they had to? At, absolutely. Uh, so when they say there's contract negotiations among the cast, I'm thinking Patrick Stewart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> pa- Patrick could have moved on and just become a dead board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they could have easily just killed him in the episode. And you would have had a Captain Riker and a First Officer Shelby, you know, carrying on possibly. And they could have, who knows who could have survived and and, and made it out. So, yeah, very, uh, very interesting. Yeah, they didn't know. And it also explains why part two feels so different compared to part one. Part one is a very, it's a, it's a mystery. It's taught. It's, it's, you know, uh, it, it literally edge your seat the whole way. And part two is very much more pedestrian, very normal, lots of techno babble. Man, it's like no one can say, oh, and it does this. No, it does this because this and this, and we need to, you know, tighten this and uh, adjust this. And oh, my. No, that I, I think that's probably a fair assessment. And yeah, if if you're that far removed from when you wrote the first half, you've lost a little of the edge, I think. Yeah, I don't even think it was the same writers. I think ev- I mean everyone was was new. In fact, I think the uh, showrunner was it uh, 
Berman or is this the when Berman officially took over? I don't know if he officially took over, but he was thinking one of the showrunners was thinking of uh quitting and moving on yeah. and then he was convinced to stay uh to go into that next season and might have been it was either Berman or Pillar? Yeah. Pillar. Wasn't there like a Michael yeah, Pillar or Michael something Pillar. like that? Yeah, one of them were 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 thinking of leaving the the show and it was a bit of a no one really knew what was going to happen <laughs> until until they they like oh yeah it's time to start filming the next season i suppose i should write that i it, it's fascinating because uh yeah no I, i'm usually up on a lot of the back end related to that i didn't know that one that's a this a little tidbit i hadn't come across but you know uh, and that's interesting too because that was the end of the third season, which really solidified that this was actually a good show. Yeah, no, absolutely. So to actually leave it that much hanging during the hiatus was, that's kind of insane. <laughs> and then, um, then I did go ahead and watch the, the episode that directly followed that, uh, love family. That, I actually love that episode. That is, I think my favorite next gen episode. I truly love that episode. Yeah, it, it's hard not to to love that. That I mean, that's just all character. It, it, yeah, and, and, and it's the one where you can let the fact that we're in the future fall away. It it that's this is about human relationships at this point, and the fact that they got to dip into that right away that's just just made the show mean more to me at that state. But that's been that's been fun. I I've enjoyed kind of just it's fun being you know, having having them all with easy access, and I can just kind of scroll through, and I might watch a season six or five, and then back up and do a three, and then jump over to seven, and it it's it's nice. The ads are still annoying me. I think at some point I will get like the Blu-rays. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you can have your physical copy too. Yes, and not have to deal with the commer- the, the badly placed uh, commercial breaks. Yeah, but just think about uh, think about that drama we're talking about when back in 1990 when this went to to be continued, and the only way we can watch any of this is if we manage to record it on our VHS <laughs> players, and. Uh, and then rewatch at our will if we if we can and if we can keep our tapes intact enough to do it uh, right to now we can just click a button and watch it as a passing fancy we could mm-hmm. never have fully conceived that then at the time no absolutely not so it, it it's it's a lot of fun maybe this means i'll actually finish ds9 and voyager at some point <laughs> Yeah, well, good luck. Oh, and a, a cause and effect, I think it's called. Uh, the one where they're tra- caught in the time loop. Oh, yeah. And they keep getting hit by the other starship. Yeah. That one? Yep. That's a good one, too. I, that's no, a lot I, of fun. I love that one. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's all I have been up to. And, uh, yeah, I guess if you don't have anything else. It's time to move on to the show. Yeah, let's do it. We'll take a break. We'll listen to a promo for another podcast. And when we get back, we're going to talk about 2009 sci-fi drama, Surrogates. Sam and Dean Winchester have been busy with saving people, hunting things, and the family business on the CW Supernatural. It sounds like a lot for someone to come along and try to catch up on the hundreds of episodes this show has to offer. But that's exactly what we're making my little sister do, whether she likes it or not. I'm Matt. I'm PG. And I'm Jess. Two of us are huge fans, one of us is an unspoiled newbie, and we're watching every episode of Supernatural together. We discuss, analyze, and playfully mock this show all to realize that everyone dies and no one gets closure. Listen to Season 14, Time for a Podcast, on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play. Robotic human surrogates combine the durability of a machine with the grace and beauty of the human body. 
With most people living their lives through their surrogate selves, our world has become a safer place. Take a seat in your STEM chair, and just with the power of your mind, you can control your surrogate and send it out into the real world. You can live your life without limitations. You see what they see, feel what they feel, and become anyone you want to be from the comfort and safety of your own home. You can finally live the life you've always dreamt of without any risk or danger to yourself. We are confronted with an unprecedented situation. Two people have died while connected to their surrogates. I think we may actually have a homicide here. First one in 15 years. The public cannot be allowed to get the idea that using a surrogate can be fatal. Especially if it's true. I just want to know how an operator can be killed by signals from a surrogate. Surreys have been blown to bits without the least bit of harm to their operators. If it were possible, it would defeat the entire purpose of surrogacy. Oh my god, Tom? You're lucky to be alive. Good thing you unplugged. How long is it since you've been out without a surrogate? Can't even remember. It's different when you actually feel the pain. What do you want from me? My wife. I am your wife. No, you're not. We could change the world and now you want to destroy it? How do I stop this? You can't. Maggie, get offline. I think something's going to happen. It's up to you. Surrogates it was from uh, Touchstone Pictures. It stars Bruce Willis, Rada Mitchell, Ving Rames, and James Cromwell, and was directed by Jonathan Mostyle. In the future year of 2023, society has been transformed by the invention of lifelike robot bodies called sur- surrogates, invented about a decade earlier. Everyone lives their best lives through these automatons as they stay home in their sim chairs. Through use of the surrogate technology, violent crime has become nearly unheard of. But when the son of the inventor of the surrogates, while visiting a nightclub in one of his father's surrogate bodies, is attacked by someone using a device that destroys the robot body while also killing the user, an L.A.-based FBI agent is put on the case to find the murderer. As he investigates, he uncovers a twisting conspiracy that could bring society as he knows it crashing down. I was questioning whether I had seen this based on the synopsis that you know we we read that that's like on on IMDb about the idea of the surrogates and the, someone having to go out and it, it sounded so freaking familiar to me, but not familiar enough for me to say yes, I have indeed seen this film. Yes, I have indeed seen this film. <laughs> I was going to say, I'd be, I'd be hard pressed to think you managed to miss this. It probably has not been since whenever it came to DVD in 09 or 2010 was probably when I watched it. I haven't seen it since and haven't given it that much thought since. Right. But I, I, I was glad to at least I wasn't going crazy because I, if it hadn't been this and I was something else, it would have driven me crazy trying to figure out what it was <laughs> that I'd either watched or read that was along the same same premise. Why I think you weren't sure whether or not you watched this is because it's incredibly derivative of a great many other things that were all out at around this time, and what I was looking up was the movie (laughs) iRobot. While not not this specific story, it's right down to James Cromwell, uh, (laughs) they're in the the movie, (laughs) and he plays essentially the same guy from one movie to the next. Oh, does he? See, that's another movie I know I've watched, but other than a few visuals, I don't remember a thing about it. In, in the iRobot case, he essentially plays the creator of the robots who then 
gets disillusioned with his creation and is separated by his company who is making a fortune off of his robots. <laughs> and, and, and therefore concocts this elaborate plan uh, to set his robots free. <laughs> And in, the, in Surrogates, James Cromwell plays an inventor of Surrogates who gets disillusioned by his invention <laughs> and is separated from the company that he started and then hatches an elaborate plan <laughs> to undo his surrogates. So it's like, there's a reason you know this story. <laughs> Maybe that is it indeed. I had uh, did not realize there was that close of a similarity with the same actor yeah right down to <laughs> we we got robots too i mean it's just how are you interfacing are they on their own or are you driving them that's the only difference in the two films uh it is always fun to see bruce willis in anything yes uh this was no exception no. uh it, he's great i he's kind of like you know bruce willis is a national treasure that's what he is <laughs> He's done some stinkers. No, let's be let's be fair. But it's hard, even if when he's in a stinker, it's hard not to enjoy it a little. Because yeah, there. yeah, and it's a really unfortunate that his career has effectively ended with his uh, affliction. He's got the uh, I forget what it is, but he can't speak. No, he can't. Breaks my heart. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Someone that could deliver such great lines. <laughs> the, and only the way Bruce Willis could. Well, and just his, <laughs> his voice, his constant tough from. guy presence, <laughs> even when he knows he's outmatched, because then then the comedy comes in. The rest of the cast, I have to admit, felt fairly generic. Yeah, they felt like well, that could have been anybody. And honestly, most of these names are names that have vague familiarity, but. I couldn't tell you where else I've I've seen them in, outside of Ving Rhames and James Cromwell, of course. Yeah, Ving Rhames is kind of hidden under his beard and dreads in this film. I, it, it wasn't until I looked at the credits that I was like, oh, oh, right, that's him. Oh no, I, I, I knew that was Ving. Actually, I kind of dug the look for him. Yeah, no, it was a good look. It was a good look. Um, the story overall in this thing, I'll admit. There isn't a whole lot in the way of surprises. No. I mean, they certainly try, but you really, if you've watched any of these types of films, you know what's going to happen. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it's fairly formulaic. Yeah. Uh, the revelation of uh, Ving Rain's The Prophet character, to me, came like I've only been sitting here waiting for that <laughs> <laughs> well and then of course there's the hero's journey to uh being accepting of the status quo taking him through questioning ultimately to side at least to a degree with the the counter proposal that's being offered in the film yes yes although they made it pretty easy for him because they, they they set up pretty early on that he was trying to turn off a little bit he didn't want to use his surrogate all the time he right. wanted him and his wife to actually spend time together uh physically not just with their surrogates and i'm gonna jump in on that note as that's what would have made this it, this is a fun movie i'm not uh, i'm not gonna lie it, it, it's enjoyable to watch the the, the some of the some of the philosophy and the things that happen on there, uh, they, they're thought provoking, but I mean, otherwise it's a popcorn movie. It's easy to turn your brain off, watch it and enjoy. Um, but if you wanted to elevate this movie, you'd get away from the car chases, the shootouts and all of that. And you'd actually dip into what it is to live in this world now. That relationship that with his wife was the most interesting thing in the movie, and we didn't really develop it. His entire relationship with his wife, the um, you know the backstory that they have that they're 
son was killed in a car, apparently in a car accident. And apparently she's been injured in that accident too. That's why she. Yeah, she's a, a she has a scar on her face. She has a scar. Yeah. She's emaciated, obviously, from being in the sim chair all the time. But I mean, she's scarred both physically and mentally from that accident. It's more or less implied, but not explored. Yes, and that's really unfortunate. And I guess that kind of piggies back, piggybacks on what you were you were saying is. Yeah, you, you kind of want a drama of just their story. You don't even necessarily have to leave their apartment. And I think there is a really good drama mm-hmm. that could be that could be had between them and exploring the you know the the, the the pain of the loss of their son. And is there more? Was it was it just an accident? Do does one of them feel responsible? Well, you know, uh, who was driving? Uh, was she driving and was he at work? I, there's all kinds of stuff where you're like, ooh, let's, let's dig into this. Let's dig into this. And instead we get, oh, what happened to your son? Uh, it was a car accident, just an accident. Well, and, and through these... That's it. Well, and through these surrogates, they have taken on different lives. He's taken his actual life, life his role as an FBI agent, and augmented it to the nth degree with his surrogate. So... He is literally diving into his work to escape how he feels about all of this. But he knows deep down that's not right either. And then his wife has explored a completely alternative lifestyle in her surrogacy. Um, well, we actually don't know. That's it. She's a complete unknown. She's an enigma. We don't know anything about his wife other than that she spends all her time in her surrogate and she's a uh, effectively a, a cos- uh, cosmologist for uh, for other surrogates. Yeah, she molds their faces and does makeup and things like that. Yeah, uh, and, but she also has this kind of social life outside that has nothing to do with her husband. No, exactly. Uh, we, which means she has separated herself from this marriage in a way, but still acknowledges that they are in a relationship. It's a very interesting and odd. <laughs> Um, circumstance, and I kind of wanted to get into that more. Well, and I would have liked to have seen how different is that from what her previous life was, right. you know, pre surrogate. Yeah, I'd like to take all the intrigue and all that and just dial in to this this life in these circumstances. I think that'd be fun. It'd be different and be interesting. The stories that could be told in this universe aren't. It's really unfortunate. It's just like, oh, let's just do a, an action right. film, and it just so happens that everybody's a robot. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Cause, That's an angle. Because <laughs> we could get it into all of that. Because my first one, the thing that I latched onto while I'm watching this is like, okay, a- accepting that um, surrogacy is now the norm. People are now ensconced in their homes while they telepresence through these robots and all that. But with this heightened level uh, of technology, the amount of information that is passing from their ba- brain remotely through the air to, to a robot and then back again, and yet they have their robots traveling on trains, going to work. And I'm like, I, even, the, even the guy in the chair, <laughs> who, who is himself, just himself, but he has surrogate robots sitting watching screens. And I'm like, the level of technology that joined you to that, we don't have better ways to do things like watch videos. Like the amount of artificial intelligence involved in all of that alone would have suggested the way that we do business on a day to day basis would probably change dramatically. But yet we've all climbed in our robot and we're going to go on with our regular life in a robot. But be really pretty. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) Or be who we always want it to be. Or, you know, we can be a, a small old white scientist who gets to go to work every day as a tall African-American man. 
<laughs> and, and, and this is where uh, I, I told you before we started recording, um, one of the interesting things when we get into the review section, um, of course, as normal, I pulled something from Roger Ebert. But what was truly fascinating about his review of the movie wasn't the review. He boiled the review down to a single sentence. What he did is start ha asking all of the questions that we want to ask now. And I want to throw one out there straight up from him because this came to mind too. In this world where we drive surrogates all day, that's how we meet each other. It's how we interact with each other. Meaning, uh, and this is what parallels with our world today, even a little bit in 2009, is the notion that you can be in an artificial environment online, you can have an avatar that does not represent exactly who you are, but that is your outward facing appearance to that particular world, and then you can be whoever you wanna be in that way. So he postulates, consider the problem of sex. This is funny coming from Roger Ebert, but I love where he's going with this. After two, after two attractive people meet, flirt, and, and desire to have sex, there are two possibilities. Number one, their avatars have some sort of mechanical encounter while their owners at home masturbate. Not things I would have thought would come up in a review by Roger Ebert. And then he goes, or number two, two real people, God forbid, have to discover how the other really looks. Since evolution suggests that we evaluate potential mates for their reproductive potential, this could lead to setbacks in the process of natural selection. So, yeah, how does, how does just general socialization work in an environment where you never come out of your room? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And you talk about uh, right now they're, they're talking about how uh, you know, the birth rate is down in, in real life yep. now yeah. in 2024. What's the birth rate looking like in this 2023 in this film? One of the things that they said during the the opening sequence was, was like, yes, here they took you through the development of, of surrogates in general, where where it was called coming from, but really surrogates as a whole, based off of their thing, has only been about three years. So we're about three years deep into. Uh, that that that's what the movie kind of stated when when the when the Supreme Court said that <laughs> surrogates right. could be part of the uh, uh, everyday life. Um, that was three years out. So you figure, okay, it's taken three years, and now where we're seeing there's been market penetration enough that most people are using surrogates in some fashion. So the more intriguing thing wouldn't be what happened in this movie. Let's check on this world. Now, granted, with the given ending, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but it would have been more interesting if you leave the surrogates in place and check in on the world in another 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And see how the world has taken to this technology overall. That was actually something that I think is a, uh, you have to believe it because the film doesn't work right. otherwise, is the idea that billions of people use surrogates. Yeah. That somehow the everyday blue collar man, a man and woman can afford a surrogate. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking there would be a, a big disparity between who's, actually a surrogate and who's not right uh, uh, to which i'm gonna segue because he wrote that too <laughs> oh did he he did yeah. he goes in this future world we learn surrogates mean that crime and racism have been Ill all but eliminated if anyone can be of any race that takes care of racism all right he's granting that but crime how do those humans who are poor and unemployed pay for their surrogates? What if you decide you want to trade up to a better model? Sure, your surrogate may have a job, but why would salaries be any better? Especially since robots make poor consumers. 
what pro- <laughs> what process actually takes place when they have a meal together at a in a restaurant? Can they eat or drink? And like, yeah, he, he like you're leading to he literally thought of too. Wouldn't this just kind of crash consumerism more or less all over the place? And it would make haves and have-nots widen even further. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, everyone would still have to eat. They just get takeout or, you know, <laughs> it, it, it'd have food delivered to their to their homes. Now I'm picturing everyone having IVs with feeder solutions into their bodies and all that. Yeah, yeah. But as far as um, things like television and uh, uh, material goods and uh, things, I I don't know. Would that change? You, you still have to dress your surrogate. Sure. Um, I'm assuming you don't want to wear the same clothes every day, but I guess conceivably you could until they wore out. Right. <laughs> but you're, you're not perspiring or... Uh, Depending on getting, your model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably. Yeah, the society just in general just it, if you scratch at it at all, the veneer just comes away. But it led to the more credible group that they called the dreads, um, uh, where there would be a class of, of people that just are completely and utterly against this. In this film, it's not just that it's a class, it's just... It's a belief system. Mm-hmm. It, it was um, it was people that just don't believe. But it, and that's another aspect of this of this universe that I think could uh, warrant a little bit more exploration. Yeah. Why? Why do they feel so violently against the idea of people using surrogates? Um, are they right? Are they wrong? I don't know. They just are. That in this film, it's they don't believe in surrogates and. That's it. We don't have any explanation as to why. No, uh, but these probing questions that just came out of a movie reviewer, plus what we have in our head, suggest why. (laughs) Yeah. But, yes, this is what that movie should have been exploring rather than the shoot-em-up parts that they actually took on. I mean, you could have really... You could have made this story and the story between the people that don't believe in the surrogates and people that do believe in surrogates. You could have easily turned that into a parable that could be uh, construed to a lot of modern topics. Mm -hmm. Even today, you you talk about uh, uh, LGBTQ. Uh, Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, there's people that, oh, no, that's... They don't believe in it. But it's like, well... What's it to you? Why, why does it matter? And that's kind of how I feel about this. Is like, what do you care that this person wants to be a surrogate? How does it affect your life? Right. Because it doesn't make necessarily make anybody better. I mean, obviously, we saw that you know the law enforcement have these modified so we can go leaping over tall buildings and stuff like that. But you get the impression that the the average surrogate is just really just a little bit maybe better than any other human being they don't the idea is they're instantly replaceable like you can be out in your life you can take some chances that you wouldn't have normally taken you can go do some things and if you get damaged it's your robot that got damaged not you but in the average life uh, if you know if you have a a surrogate as your barista you know they're not going to make your coffee any better because they're a surrogate and that's the part that was confusing me with in the movie is we're in a world where there's all these surrogates, but people are still living regular lives in their surrogates. And I'm like, that doesn't jive for me. <laughs> he kind of misses the point of having the surrogate. Right. Like, I'm not going to go to my normal workaday life <laughs> in a robot if that's if I have other options. Yeah, the the world just doesn't make sense. It is a world that exists purely because the plot says that this world has to exist. <laughs> no, it, it it does, but but it's hard not it, it it's hard to be an intelligent human being watching this movie and going, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> like I don't uh, know that I'd be down this road <laughs> if if I had a robot at my fingertips like that. And weirdly enough, 
this film really doesn't fit our theme all that well because you erase the surrogates and the surrounding technology. Yeah. The rest of this universe is just like our universe. In fact, in fact, it's really interesting. This universe, supposedly in sometime in the 2020s, is 2009 still. Yeah. And I, I kind of, uh, I postulated to my family after we watched this is like, does that mean that the rest of technology has effectively turned kind of into a dark age? Did it, did it stunt? Uh, advancements in other technologies because everyone's in these in these surrogates so they're still driving 2009 Priuses <laughs> and 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 Chevys um there, there there's no attempt to like create a future world outside of the robots true but I, I'm I'm gonna take this more in the direction of it could be an allegory of today um Think about us just going through the pandemic and having to live our lives mostly virtual during that period of time. And that is what this movie at least tried in its weird way to take on. The concept that what happens when humanity goes completely virtual? Is it the same? Or, or we, in their version, life carried on as normal you just got to do so from the comfort of your home. But having lived in the world that we live in now and watching what happens, I, I argue the world doesn't work so well when you go completely virtual. No, maybe. And maybe that's the only way it, it, it really fits is it sort of pre- tried to predict what would happen. And yeah, I think it kind of got it wrong <laughs> well yeah could, could, well in, in their case they had an automaton to to l- l- let go live their life so they're out in the world they're doing things and they're safe from disease and injury and all that stuff which is part of what we were trying to accomplish by going virtual through the pandemic be at home be safe don't pass anything but still more or less live your life the, the only difference is they still have a way to connect with other people, even if it's semi-artificial, uh, mm-hmm. whereas our version of the world, the connection never made it. We Right, yeah, we didn't have it. We literally were on screens at, at best. Yes, and, and it is actually in my own work, it's brought up the conversation of can can you really run an organization where you're not around each other because half of what is learned or thought of or ideas that are generated are out of casual conversation and you can't Mm -hmm. do it. At least in the surrogates world, they are still having those conversations. So um, if anything, it shows us a way to do it and not necessarily an ideal way. (laughs) Another thing, if we can kind of jump towards the end, because I'm not, I'm, through most of these films and I don't think we've really tried to not spoil much these older films in the end James Cromwell's character decides he invented the surrogates because he wanted to give um, people like himself who was confined to a wheelchair Mm. a chance to live quote unquote normal life which in and of itself is kind of insulting to a lot of to that would be considered insulting to a lot of people it is the, the the company VCI or whatever it is, they decided to try to take it to the everyman, mm-hmm. live your best life, and the you can be a a, a milk toast individual and walk around in a you know a big Superman type body or, or or whatever, or you could all look like supermodels, and that's and that's where they they parted ways, they fired him from the the, the business, mm-hmm. and so he came with this design. So he decided the circuits was a bad idea, and he's going to destroy them all. And this weapon that he has, this virus that he's trying to upload, will not only destroy the circuits but kill the users. So he's willing to kill billions of people. Yes. This this genius who created the circuits created this vast network of you know stay at home and and live your life through these robots and everything. He didn't think about 
oh, what we need to just do is uh, buffer the users away and hit, hit control alt delete and the <laughs> users will be fine. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> the super genius figured the best way is to kill billions of people and didn't think, oh, well, you know what? If I just turn them all off first, <laughs> it'll, it'll all be good. <laughs> Yeah, see, you're not always supposed to think about that part a whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> but no, uh, uh, agreed. It seems a little short-sighted, especially given um, he, he developed this as a way to uh, enrich lives that had been limited in some fashion. And yes. so he s switched completely over to everyone's a vacuous knob and needs to be killed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He goes to... I want I want to help the less fortunate to I want to commit genocide. Yeah. <laughs> and, and genocide on a scale unheard of. He, he would essentially wipe out all but maybe a third of the human population. Yes. And here's another discussion that should be had in this film and it doesn't because at in the end they were able to protect all the users. But if Bruce Willis doesn't hit the yes, the, the Y key, uh, it's going to just still destroy all the surrogates, and he lets it happen. And all the surrogates are destroyed. He, he actually actively hits, like, no. no. Yes. Yeah, and to allow the, the virus to upload and destroy all the surrogates. And then the film effectively ends, and I was like, he doesn't have that right. <laughs> you know, whether you may or may not agree with whether the surrogates are a good idea... He had no right to make that decision for literally billions of people. Are we going to talk about that at all? <laughs> no. We're going to have him go home, hug his real wife, and roll credits. <laughs> and here's my thing, uh, uh, and this gets into other people talking about it, too. So that ending, since you, you've let it on that that's where that all went... Um, and particularly that ending where he goes home and he hugs his wife. That leads back to the whole, we should have been following them, period. That's yeah. that's what yeah. this movie should have been about. It's what it kind of wanted to be about and just didn't. It wanted to be an action movie when it really needed to be more of a drama. Um, mm hmm which is why a lot of people actually think the end of the movie should have just been the overhead shot of all of the surrogates dead in the streets and then cut the movie. That just let us all wonder, because we didn't get an answer out of the hug, but we weren't invested no. in the, the relationship like we should have been. So it would have been probably better to just go out on the whole, okay, now what does this world do? Yeah, because I'm not... I don't have any sense that their relationship is saved by any stretch of the imagination. No, not at all. If anything... Uh, she is going to... She's going to be an absolute mess without her surrogate to, to, to live through. She's going to be a mess, and if she finds out he's the one that hit the no button, that's even yeah. going to complicate it further. So if anything, if we're going to go down that road... We need the movie from that point on. Because <laughs> that's where the real fireworks are going to start. Yeah, I mean, honestly, isn't he effectively guilty of the destruction of personal property times 7 billion? <laughs> well, and again, to give Roger Ebert some credit here, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but uh, he actually pointed out to everybody living their life from their, their home in their chair, assuming they're in there basically for roughly, I don't know how life is supposed to work. If you spend 16 hours of your waking day as the robot while laying down, do you sleep? And what's that like? And then if all you're doing is being sedentary on this level, Muscle atrophy goes very quickly if you're not going to move around at all. So yeah. most of these people, as soon as their surrogates cut off, are still stranded in their home because they can't get up. So, yeah, yeah. No, it doesn't explore that at all. No. <laughs> that, 
that should have been something when uh, when Bruce Willis, when the, his character starts venturing out in the real world. The, the closest they come is the idea of like, oh, he has a lot of anxiety because he's the you know a real person out in the world again. I'm thinking, but why? He gets constant feedback from his surrogate, so it's like he's always out in the real world. Yeah. So what difference would it make? I, I I think based off of just their explanation of this, uh, it, it like it said, it's not the sensory overload or anything. It's the it's the anxiety that now things can happen to you and they last. <laughs> so depending on you'd have to be in that chair a really long time. Is three years theoretically? If assuming we just snapped our fingers, everybody a billion people had surrogates in the past three years. Is that enough time to be detached from the world to actually experience any psychological impact? Maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. Yeah. But again, these are the things that I want to explore about this world, not the, the stupid little showdown with the inventor. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's really unfortunate that it doesn't, uh, doesn't go where it should. Yeah. It's just, I mean, maybe they couldn't really explore all of that in a single film, but... They didn't even try, and that's, I think, the, the disappointing bit. No, and they're, I'm trying to remember that. Uh, there, I, I remember it. Uh, it didn't last long. There was a series on Netflix called Altered Carbon. Oh, I never got, got a chance to look into that. I've heard it was pretty good. It was very good, uh, but it, it kind of took this concept where essentially we're just all, what makes us us is uploaded into a computer and you just literally plug it into a new body. Um, and those that have, are rich enough can plug it into more than one. Uh, but that's another story. But that actually explores more of what this movie should have than, than this movie did. So unfortunately, it only got cut to two seasons. So Okay. Well, I did mention on uh, social medias that we were going to be watching this. I only got one comment from Matt over on our Discord channel. He says, I saw this a couple of times when it first hit the movie channels, and I remember thinking the world it was set in was more interesting than the story taking place. Yeah. It's not terrible, but ultimately feels like another wannabe Matrix with a quote-unquote, we're too disconnected as a society message. Accurate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much. Uh, but I guess I'm very curious to hear what the rest of the critics had to say about this. Uh, over to the professionals. Um, from Entertainment Weekly, we have Lisa Schwartzbaum. There's fun robot stuff, some good philosophical ideas, and a brief nutty Willis Ving Rainey's reunion after uh, 15 years after Pulp Fiction. That that's that's <laughs> the thrust of her entire review, and that's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, all right. Moving on. <laughs> New York Post, Kyle Smith. Among cheesy sci-fi movies meant to make you think, I'll take surrogates over District 9. Both are highly derivative, but it, in the course of recombining the basic chromosomes of Blade Runner, The Matrix, and especially iRobot, surrogates nudges the robo-thriller in an interesting direction. So... Positive amongst all of that. Yeah, no, that's fine. And just piggybacking off that, and you mentioned it too, this is a fun film to watch. It it's just you want don't more. think about it too much because you're going to have problems. Right, yeah, because, I mean, Matt nailed it. It's the notion that uh, this, is an, a fa this is a fascinating world and we didn't even scratch the surface of it. No. You want to explore more of that. Uh, so from the middle to low end of the pack is uh, Chicago Sun-Times, Roger Ebert. Aside from all of the stuff that we even went through already, he really boils it down to um, surrogates is entertaining and ingenious, but it settles too soon for, for, for formula. And then he points out one other thing. It ends with the wrong shot. The correct shot would have been the overhead exterior of the street about four shots earlier. You'll know what I mean. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I agreed with that before I even read it. <laughs> so, Boston Globe, Ty Burr, a reasonably watchable sci-fi B-movie. 
A case of good of a good director and some intriguing ideas struggling to overcome formula plotting, limp dialogue, and a serious case of the sillies. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I pop in robots is a little silly, uh, but. <laughs> Um, and then finally, uh, I took from uh, New York Daily News, Elizabeth Weitzman. The filmmakers were too busy throwing together potential blockbuster material to notice all the loose ends and gaping holes in, log- in logic, which may ultimately explain why Willis looks so confused throughout. <laughs> Maybe he, too, is straining to locate some intelligence amid all the machinery. And just jumping back to Roger for a second, he did point out, uh, uh, and I'm going to read this just because it was funny. It's a relief when something goes wrong with Greer's avatar, that's Bruce Willis's character, and he must venture onto the streets as himself, middle-aged, bald, and looking, I must say, considerably more attractive than his creepy surrogate. <laughs> I, I had to agree with that. The the granted, some of that's probably uh, I don't know if they did just lots of makeup and and, and a wig. Yeah, I could do if it, if that was like some sort of early CGI rotoscoping or if it was makeup for everybody. But everyone had that um, just the side of uncanny valley look about they, them. They they did, and Bruce Willis in particular, he looked way off as his surrogate. Um, which is why I thought it was amusing when people know when he came, ventured out into the world as himself, and he's like, "Hey, hey, you kind of look like your surrogate." <laughs> like, I would dare say, I, I actually agree with Roger. I think his more grizzled, real human look actually was better <laughs> than that that cheesy pretty boy. Yeah, he looked like he he would have fit better in the Barbie movie. <laughs> yes, yes, because he... Uh, and He's a Ken. Granted, the surrogates, uh, they did they did try to achieve a level of plastic look about them all. All of yes. them. The yes. The top end even still looked kind of plasticky. I loved it when they would introduce the more inferior models once in a while. <laughs> oh, and just real quick, that's another... My God. Another discussion to be had. We're fighting wars was surrogates right. and what does that mean and and you know does that make uh wars easier to fight oh let's just go to war because we'll just send surrogates well it also begs the question who are they fighting are they fighting another army of surrogates right yeah violent crime is all but eliminated but we're still at war <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that that didn't make sense. And then it starts. Oh, I, I start flashing on the uh, the Star Trek original series episode where the two factions are are warring by simply saying the computer said this many people died, so go into the chamber and die. Uh, yeah, it had that feel about it when they were doing the war thing. Here's how I'll sum up this film: watch it and enjoy it, but don't think about it because it's only going to frustrate you. Or find lots of friends to banter about with it endlessly. Because you can do that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I wouldn't do that because I as I'm feeling now, it's frustrating. It is. <laughs> it's frustrating me talking about the film and actually having to point out all the problems with the movie. I wish this wasn't a podcast and I could just go, oh, no, that's a fun movie. You should watch it and just end it. <laughs> <laughs> What we'll have to do is to have a jump ahead button. <laughs> if you want to like this film, go to minute number. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that will probably do it for 2009 surrogates. Indeed. Um, fun as always. Next time, next full episode, we are going to go a little bit more. This was definitely a, a big budget B movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to go to probably a little bit smaller budget B movie <laughs> and take a look at 1996's Sci Fighters starting Roddy McDowell. Uh, no. Yeah, Roddy. No. Roddy starring Roddy Piper. There you go. Those are two way different people. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we're going to see, I believe the uh, 
It's filled in 1996, and I think it's predicts. Oh, I already forgot. I think it predicts the uh, late 2000s, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, 2009 I'm at maybe. Our list, it says about 2009. Okay, there you go. So, a little over a decade from the time of uh, release. So we'll see what they thought we'd be up to in 10 years. <laughs> The, or 10 years from then. This is a fun exploration. This should be good. All right. Well, if you have any thoughts on surrogates or if you have happened to have seen Psy Fighters, if you're a Roddy Piper completionist and you've seen all his films, all of a dozen, I don't know how many movies he's got, uh, please drop us an email at timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com or follow the link in the show notes to any of the social media sites and leave some comments there. Appreciate you listening. Please uh if you can share the episode you're listening, except for the ones that have the bad audio, I <laughs> really almost want to delete them, but kind of can't. I I could. You could <laughs> don't. But yeah, and we'll be back in a, in a couple weeks. So uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Bye. See ya.